Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. I think Steven Pinker has written the most important book in many years. Yeah, that's why he's here tonight. Um, and there's a Long Now aspect to it, which is that many people get the sort of gist of the book, which is that violence, cruelty, and injustice have been going down for quite a while. And the first response that many people have is, well, wait a minute, come on, there's civil wars going on. I read in the paper this morning, there's rape over here and murder over there and violence in Libya or wherever. And what you're seeing there is something that I hadn't really thought about before reading this book, which is the Long Now Foundation has been helping deal with a common social psychological concept, which is discounting the future. Um, we tend to put all of the value into the present and into the near future and discount the long future. In a way, the long now and building a 10,000-year clock is going to keep ticking exactly the same for century after century, millennium after millennium, into the future. The idea is to start taking the future with the same kind of seriousness that we take next week. Next 10,000 years, next week, same thing. What I think Pinker's book demonstrates is that we also have a tendency to discount the past and the absolute lethality and cruelty that humans used to inflict on each other. Because it was long ago, we don't take it with the kind of serious, seriousness that we take what's going on right now. And Pinker going backward, the same way the 10,000-year clock going forward, helps us not discount the past. Steven Pinker. Thanks so much, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Believe it or not, and I know most people do not, Violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and today we may be living in the most peaceful era in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought rates of violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it is a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. I'm going to walk you through six major declines of violence, identify their immediate causes, that is, particular historical events of the era, and also try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, that is, general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until around 5,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was life like in this state of nature? This is a question that thinkers have pondered for centuries. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes famously wrote that uh, in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A century later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. Now, it turns out that these two gentlemen were speculating from the armchair. Neither of them had any idea what life was like in a uh, state of nature. But today we can do better because there are two sources of evidence on rates of violent death in non-state societies. The first is forensic archaeology. You can think of this as CSI Paleolithic. Namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma, like bashed-in skulls, decapitations, arrowheads embedded in bones, and mummies found with ropes around their necks? Uh, I've assembled here uh, 19 estimates, and they span quite a range. Uh, they, uh, what I've plotted here is the percentage of... Uh, skeletons showing signs of violent trauma, but they average out to about 15%. 15% of prehistoric remains show some signs of violence. Let's compare that 15% figure to those of some modern state societies. Uh, the United States and Europe in the 20th century, with uh, all of their wars, come out at 6 tenths of 1%. Uh, if you try to uh, bump up the estimate 
to uh, the highest credible value by throwing in all the indirect deaths from starvation and uh, disease in the wake of a war, all of the genocides, all the man-made famines. You can bump the figure up to about 3%. And if you look at the world in the uh, 21st century, the graph is invisible at less than uh, a pixel high because it's less than three one-hundredths of one percent. The second source of evidence on uh, rates of violence in non-state societies comes from ethnographic vital statistics. The wave of uh, state settlement that swept over the globe starting around 5,000 years ago left a few pockets of the earth still in anarchy, namely uh, hunter-gatherer, hunter-horticultural, and other tribal societies. And ethnographers who have lived with them for extended periods of time have tallied up the rates of death from various causes, including warfare. I found 27 estimates in the anthropological literature, and once again, they span uh, quite a range. I've plotted them here as war deaths per 100,000 people per year, but the average is 524 per 100,000 per year. That is, every year, one half of 1% of the population dies in warfare. Let's compare that 524 figure to those of some modern states, and I'll stack the deck against modernity by picking some of the most uh, violent states in their most violent periods, such as Germany in the 20th century with two world wars, and their rate is 144. Russia in the 20th century, two world wars and a civil war, uh, 135. Japan in the 20th century, a world war that ended in two nuclear explosions with a rate of 27. United States in the 20th century, uh, with uh, two world wars and half a dozen other foreign wars with a rate of 5.7. Uh, the world in the 20th century, again, seeking the maximum estimate by summing the deaths uh, direct and indirect from war, also the deaths from genocide and man-made famines, uh, the rate is uh, about 60. And the world uh, in the 21st century has a rate whose bar is less than a pixel high at uh, three-tenths of a uh, war death per 100,000 per year. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. Uh, the immediate cause was the rise and expansion of states, leading to the various paxes that history students are taught, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on. As a state uh, exerts hegemony over a territory, uh, it will tend to stamp out tribal raiding and feuding, not because the early kings and emperors had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their citizens, but rather because tri tribal raiding and feuding are a nuisance to the overlords who would just as soon keep the people alive to supply them with soldiers and slaves and taxes. So just as a farmer has an interest in preventing his cattle from killing each other, not necessarily because he cares for the uh, cattle, but because it's just a dead loss to him, so the early kings and emperors had an interest in pacifying the territories that they controlled. The second decline of violence can be appreciated by pondering this woodcut showing a day in the life in the Middle Ages. And the uh, process that brought these rates of violence down has been called the civilizing process. Turns out that homicide statistics go back in uh, many parts of Europe 800 years, and historical criminologists have plotted them over time, such as in this plot of uh, homicide rates in England from 1200 to the present. It's plotted on a logarithmic scale from a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 per year to one to 10 to 100. And uh, it shows that there has been a massive decline in the rate of homicide, so that a contemporary Englishman is about uh, one thirty-fifth as likely to be murdered as his medieval ancestor. This is true not just in England, but in every country for which records go back. Here we see Italy, the Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. Here is the average of those five regions, and for the sake of comparison, I've also plotted the rate for the non-state societies, that 524 per 100,000 per year figure. This gap is what I've been calling the pacification process, this further decline, uh, the civilizing process.
The immediate cause was uh, identified by a German sociologist named Norbert Elias in his book called The Civilizing Process, in which he suggested that in the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms out of the patchwork of uh, feudal baronies and principalities and duchies. With it, criminal justice was nationalized, and the constant feuding and warlord activity of medieval knights gave way to the king's justice. Also during this transition, there was a growing infrastructure of commerce. Financial instruments such as money and contracts that could be recognized within the borders of the newly consolidated states, and technological improvements such as uh, uh, better roads and carts and instruments of timekeeping that lubricated commerce and exchange. As a result, zero-sum plunder began, began to give way to positive-sum trade, a point that I'll return to toward the end of the, of the lecture this evening. The third historical transition can be appreciated by recalling some of the ways that the early kingdoms kept law and order within their uh, territories. Brutal punishments such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing, sawing in half, and impalement. But in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, these forms of sadistic, gruesome punishment were abolished. This timeline shows the number of major countries with torture as a form of criminal punishment, showing that there was a precipitous decline in the second half of the 18th century, including the prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the American Constitution, which took place right in the middle of this uh, process. Uh, also abolished during the humanitarian revolution was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the law books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and <laughs> strong evidence of malice in a child 14, 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in the United States, uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the death penalty was prescribed and frequently used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. Uh, indeed, this graph, which runs from colonial times to the present, shows that the uh, percentage that uh, several hundred years ago, a majority of executions were for crimes other than murder. Today, the only crime other than murder punished by death is conspiracy to commit murder. The death penalty itself, uh, of course, has been abolished in every major democracy except the United States. Here we have a timeline from 1775 to the present showing the number of European countries that have capital punishment on the, their law books. The, uh, most of the decline happened in the 20th century, particularly the second half of the 20th century. But more interesting is the blue timeline, which shows the number of European countries that actually carry out executions, which showed a decline that began far earlier. And on average, 50 years elapsed between the last time a execution was actually carried out in a European country and the time that the lawmakers caught up with the practices and uh, struck the death penalty from their law books. Now, as I mentioned, the United States, as with, uh, have, it must be said, many of the trends that I mentioned is in the uh, lags behind other Western democracies. But even in the United States, for all its notoriety, the death penalty is a shadow of its former self. This graph from 1625 to the present shows the number of executions uh, per capita, uh, number per 100,000 people per year. And as you can see, by historical standards, uh, even in Texas, they execute a tiny fraction of the number of people that used to be routinely executed in the past. Today in the United States, there are about 40 executions uh, per year in a country that has more than 16,000 homicides per year. And over the course of the two years in which I wrote Better Angels of Our Nature, I had to amend it three times because three more states abolished capital punishment between the time I began the book and the time I sent it to the publisher. And that is a trend that uh, is bound to continue. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution like burning heretics, dueling, 
blood sports, debtor's prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on uh, the planet. The Bible had no problem with it. Democratic Athens, uh, no problem at all. Then, starting in the 18th century, country after country uh, began to abolish slavery, a process that culminated in 1980 with the abolition of slavery in Mauritania, with the result that for the last three decades we've been living in an unprecedented period in history in which slavery is not legal anywhere on the planet. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? A plausible answer might be affluence. Perhaps as people's lives get longer and more comfortable, they place a higher value on uh, their own life and by extension, life in general, including the lives of others. Unfortunately, the timing doesn't seem to work. Um, it, this graph, which shows per capita income in England from 1220 to the present, shows that the uh, lion's share of the improvement took place in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. The uh, affluence barely budged during the 18th century when these reforms uh, were launched. Uh, a more uh, empirically justifiable answer would be the rise of printing and literacy. This graph shows that prior to the 18th century, there was a 25-fold increase in the efficiency of uh, book production. That Those uh, gains were put into practice so that in the 18th century, there was an exponential increase in the number of books published per year, a kind of uh, early version of Moore's Law. And it was during the 18th century that, uh, for the first time, a majority of uh, Englishmen could read them. That's when literacy first uh, broke the 50% mark and stayed there. Why should literacy matter? Well, there's another name for this revolution. We call it the Enlightenment, uh, because knowledge began to replace superstition and ignorance. And if you have a literate and a better and better informed population that gets disabused of notions such as that Jews poison wells, heretics go to hell, witches cause crop failures, children are possessed by the devil which has to be beaten out of them, Africans are brutish and fit for and only for enslavement, then uh, the institutions are bound to change as a result. As Voltaire said during this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, literacy is a technology of cosmopolitanism, the mixing of people and ideas. And it's not implausible that as people begin to consume more fiction and history and journalism, they start to inhabit other people's minds, try to imagine what the lives of others are like, and conceivably this could expand their circle of empathy and decrease their taste for cruelty. Another idea that I'll return to toward the end of the talk. The fourth decline of violence has been called the long peace, and it speaks to the frequently made assertion that the 20th century was the most violent in history. However, People who make that claim never cite numbers from any century other than the 20th. This is a uh, trend based on one data point. <laughs> and there are many reasons to doubt it. Um, for one thing, the so-called peaceful 19th century was not so peaceful if you look at the entire world and the entire century. The 19th century saw in Europe the Napoleonic Wars, one of the most destructive wars in European history with four million deaths. The most destructive civil war in history, which few people have even heard of, the Taiping Rebellion in China with 20 million deaths. The most destructive war in American history, the Civil War, 650,000. In Southern Africa, the conquests of Shaka Zulu killed uh, one to two million people. In South America, the most proportionally destructive interstate war of all times was the War of the Triple Alliance, which killed perhaps 60% of the population of Paraguay. Then there were African slave raiding wars and imperial wars in Af Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific, whose death tolls we can't even begin to estimate. Also, though uh, it's certainly true that the Second World War was the deadliest single event in human history in terms of the absolute number of people who were killed, it is not as clear that it is the deadliest event in terms of the proportion of the population that was affected, because the 20th century, after all, had more people than earlier centuries. 
here um, I've taken uh, a list of the 100 worst things that people have ever done to each other from a uh, man who calls himself an atrocitologist, uh, Math <laughs> Matthew White. Uh, and I've plotted them over 2,500 years of human history from 500 BCE to the present, scaled by the population of the world at the time. Uh, as you can see, history's worst atrocities were pretty evenly distributed over 2,500 years of human history. There is, to be sure, oh, and by the way, World War II comes in at ninth place. World War I doesn't even make the top ten. There is, to be sure, a uh, funneling down of the data cloud as you get closer to the present, but presumably this doesn't mean that in ancient times they only committed really big atrocities, and more recently we've also been committing medium size and small atrocities. Uh, but far more likely, it's a reflection of the historical record. The farther back you go, the less likely it was that a smaller atrocity was uh, recorded by anyone. We can, uh, for the last 500 years, zoom in because the uh, invention of the printing press and, and uh, spread of literacy means that our historical records are better, and look at trends in great power war. These are the wars that affect the five to ten biggest countries or empires of the day, the 800-pound guerrillas, whose wars, because of the statistical distribution of war, account for a majority of deaths in all wars combined, and whose wars were momentous enough that they were unlikely to have been missed by any of the uh, chroniclers of the day. This is a data set that comes from Jack Levy. The first graph, all of these span uh, half a millennium, showed the proportion of years that the great powers fought each other. And what it shows is that several hundred years ago, the figures were often 100%, that is, the great powers were f fighting each other in 100% of years. Uh, that's kind of what great powers did. They fought other great powers. But more recently, the, uh, that figure has fallen to zero. This graph shows the duration of wars involving a great power, which also has been in decline. History used to have things like the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War. The 20th century had the Six-Day War. Here we have the frequency of wars with a great power on at least one side, and that too has been in decline over the last 500 years. There was, however, one trend that went in the opposite direction for most of this period, which is once a great power started a war, how many people was it able to kill per country per year? And because of uh, developments in military technology and organization, that figure actually increased for most of this period. Wars became more deadly once they began. Uh, but even that figure did a U-turn uh, after the Second World War. So we're now living in an era in which the frequency of wars, the duration of wars, and the concentration of deadliness of wars are all simultaneously in decline. If you multiply those figures uh, out to tally the total number of deaths from all great power wars combined, the trends do a lot of canceling and zigzagging for most of the time, but the lowest point in 500 years corresponds to the most recent quarter century. For the last 100 years, we can zoom in still uh, in finer detail and plot the rate of death from all wars from the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st. And what the graph shows is that there were two unmistakable uh, spikes of bloodletting centered on the two world wars, but contrary to predictions that this would just begin a sequence of more and more destructive wars, uh, the Second World War turned out to be something more of a last gasp than a harbinger of things to come. And since then, the rate of wars has been, uh, deaths in war, I'm sorry, has been in decline. This is the period that historians call the long peace. The fact that since 1946, there's been a historically unprecedented decline in interstate wars, that is, wars with a government on each side. And in fact, the most striking statistic of the long peace is zero refers to the number of wars between the two greatest powers of them all, the US and the Soviet Union. Contrary to all expert predictions, World War III never happened. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki. Again, every expert predicted that a nuclear war was uh, inevitable. It never happened. There have been no wars between any two great powers since the end of the Korean War in 1953. 
No wars between Western European countries. And sometimes people have to be reminded that this is an interesting uh, development. Uh, it would be easy to think, well, of course there are. Who would ever expect, say, France and Germany to go to war? But uh, this intuition is itself historically surprising. Prior to 1945, there were two new wars a year for 600 years in Western Europe alone. As after 1945, that fell to zero. And there have been no wars between developed countries uh, since 1945. The 40 uh, richest countries in the world have not come to blows. Uh, again, this almost sounds obvious. We think of war as something that happens in those poor, backward uh, parts of the southern hemisphere. But uh, this, w it was not always like this. It used to be the richest, most advanced countries that were constantly at each other's throats. And because these were big, rich countries that could afford big, destructive armies, the wars that they did get embroiled in uh, could cause a lot of damage. Well, what about the rest of the world? In a process that I call the new peace, the long peace appears to be spreading to the rest of the world. Now, I mentioned that since 1946, there have been fewer interstate wars. There have, however, been more civil wars, as newly independent states with inept governments defended themselves against insurgent movements. Both sides often uh, armed, financed, and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. Uh, but let me show you this trend quantitatively in a stacked layer graph where the thickness of each layer that I'm going to show you corresponds to the number of wars in each of four categories. Where a war for the point of this graph is an armed conflict that kills as few as 25 people in a year. First, we have the uh, number of colonial wars since 1946, and that uh, abruptly ended in the 1970s as the last European empire gave up the last of its colonies. Here we have the number of interstate wars, very few, as I've mentioned, and uh, trickling down to hardly any. However, here we have the number of pure civil wars and the number of internationalized civil wars where some external power butts in to uh, help the government defend itself. And both of those showed an increase uh, through the early 90s. But with the end of the Cold War, uh, even the number of civil wars started to decline. And the, num the total number of wars, therefore, which is re represented by the height of the entire stack. The crucial question, though, is which wars kill more people, the declining number of interstate wars or the increasing number of civil wars? And the answer is, uh, to that is pretty clear. Here we have the deadliness of interstate wars, and uh, those have been, that is the number of people killed per conflict per year, and those have been in precipitous decline. The increase in the deadliness of internationalized and pure civil wars doesn't come close to making up for the decline in deaths from the interstate wars. If you now, once again, multiply these two figures together, number of wars, number of people killed per war, uh, you get the following stacked layer graph. Here we have the number, the rate of death from colonial wars, which tapered off to zero. The rate of death from interstate wars, which shows a bumpy but unmistakable decline with spikes corresponding to the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the Iran-Iraq War. And here we have the rate of death from pure civil wars and internationalized civil wars. Uh, all, the entire stack has, shows a decline, and here we are in the first decade of the 20th century with a thin laminate of layers showing a historically unprecedented low rate of death uh, for, of war of all kinds uh, uh, altogether. What were the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? Well, three hypotheses were thrown out uh, 200 years ago by Immanuel Kant in his essay, Perpetual Peace in which he argued that democracy, trade, and an international community w should work to disincentivize leaders from starting uh, destructive wars. More recently, the political scientists Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have tested Kant's hypothesis with a large data set of militarized disputes, and they found that uh, Kant got it right three out of three times. All of these have increased in the second half of the 20th century, and all of them are statistical predictors of peace, holding all other factors constant. 
Here, for example, you see the number of democracies in the world, which has uh, increased, and the number of autocracies, which has decreased. We're living in a time where there are more democracies than autocracies. Here we see international trade, which uh, skyrocketed starting uh, after the Second World War. And here we have the membership in intergovernmental organizations, such as the uh, United Nations, whose charter was signed, uh, I believe, here in this very building, uh, and uh, which, uh, however, it culminated a trend that began much earlier, but one that uh, accelerated after the end of the Second World War. There are lots and lots of intergovernmental organizations forming a virtual international community that nations increasingly belong to. Finally, we have the rights revolutions, the targeting of violence on smaller scales directed against vulnerable sectors of the population, such as racial minorities, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. The civil rights revolution put an end to the practice of lynching. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, more than 150 African Americans were lynched in the United States every year. That fell precipitously and reached zero by the 1950s. Hate crime murders of blacks have only been recorded since the 1990s, and they were never very plentiful to begin with, but uh, they have decreased to uh, one a year. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks, such as intimidation and assault, have been in decline. And the kind of racist attitudes that set the stage for violence against blacks have also been in decline. Here we have the result of two public opinion polls from the 1940s to the present asking whether uh, white Americans, whether black and white students should go to separate schools and whether they would move out if a black family moved in next door. Both of them have declined from a majority of the population to single digits. They're now considered to be in the range of crank opinion, and the questions aren't even included on, uh, in the questionnaires anymore. This is a worldwide phenomenon. This graph shows the number of countries that uh, discriminate against ethnic minorities with apartheid or Jim Crow laws. The blue line shows the number of countries that bend over backwards with remedial or affirmative action policies to try to uh, bring up the uh, status of their formerly discriminated against minorities. Now we have more countries with affirmative action policies than we have countries with discriminatory policies. The women's rights revolution has seen an 80% decrease in the rate of rape since st statistics were first kept. Uh, a similarly dramatic decline in rates of domestic violence, a uh, dramatic decline in the most extreme form of domestic violence of all, namely uxoricide, the killing of girlfriends and wives, and mariticide, the killing of boyfriends and husbands. And uh, the graph shows somewhat surprisingly that there's been an even steeper decline in the rate of killing of male partners than female partners. The women's rights movement has been very, very good for husbands. The children's rights revolution has seen a steady decline in the number of American states that permit corporal punishment in schools, like uh, paddling and strapping. Every public opinion poll in the West has shown a decline in the approval and practice of spanking children. Rates of child abuse have gone down since they were first measured, both physical abuse and sexual abuse, as have rates of violence in schoolyards and playgrounds, such as fights and non-fatal crimes. The gay rights revolution has seen an increase in the number of states that have decriminalized homosexuality, both uh, nation states worldwide and American states, which now stands at 50 out of 50 following a Supreme Court decision. Anti-gay attitudes have been in steady decline, such as whether homosexuality is considered morally wrong, uh, whether it should be made illegal, or whether gay people should be denied equal opportunity. And uh, the anti-gay hate crime of intimidation has been in decline since records were first kept. Finally, the animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a sharp decline in the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. Well, this, all this brings up the question, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? Uh, one possibility is that human nature has changed. 
and that somehow people have had their inclinations toward violence literally bred out of them. Well, I consider this possibility extremely unlikely. Uh, for one thing, we still see violence in our unsocialized children, a large percentage of two-year-olds kick, bite, and hit. Uh, and play fighting among boys is one of the most robust human universals. We continue to get tremendous enjoyment out of witnessing simulated and vicarious violence, uh, as in murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, hockey, and uh, movies starring a certain ex-governor of this very state. And then there are homicidal fantasies. Uh, a number of social psychologists have asked people the following question. Have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Well, it turns out that about 15% of women and a third of men frequently fantasize about killing people. <laughs> about 60% uh, of uh, women and 75% of men at least occasionally fantasize about killing people. What does this say about human nature? It tells us that 25% of men are liars. Uh, a more likely possibility is that human nature is extraordinarily complex and has always comprised inclinations toward violence and inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the, called the better angels of our nature, and that historical circumstances have increasingly favored our peaceable inclinations. What are the uh, motives for violence that I think are uh, always with us? One of them is the... Uh, incentive to raw exploitation, the elimination of a person that happens to be an obstacle on the path to something that you want, resulting in rape, plunder, conquest, and the uh, elimination of rivals. There's dominance, the urge among individuals to climb the pecking order and become alpha male, and the corresponding urge among groups for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. There's revenge or moralistic violence, the uh, conviction that not only is violence justifiable, but it is obligatory to punish some prior harm or sin, resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then there are uh, ideologies that license violence, such as militant religions, nationalism, Nazism, and communism, which justify violence by a kind of uh, pernicious uh, cost-benefit analysis premised on the hope of a utopia, a world that will be infinitely good forever. If the ends are infinitely good, then the means can be as violent as you want, and you're always uh, ahead of the game. You're always on the positive side of the le ledger. Also, let's say that you announce your dream of a world that would be infinitely good forever, and there are some people who just don't get with the program. They, uh, they stand in your way. Uh, they are the only thing that is blocking the, uh, a world that will be infinitely good forever. Well, how evil are they? You do the math. Uh, they are deserving of arbitrarily severe punishment. And that's why, paradoxically, the worst atrocities in human history were motivated by idealistic, moralistic movements. Well, what do we have on the other side to counteract these motives for violence? What are the better angels of our nature? There's self-control, circuitry concentrated in the frontal lobe of the brain that can anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit our violent impulses. There's empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, a set of norms and taboos that regulate behavior. And finally, there's reason, cognitive processes that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. The key question now being, which historical developments bring out our better angels and stay our hands before they can commit acts of bloodshed? One possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he called for a Leviathan, a state and judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. A state can uh, uh, reduce violence by eliminating the incentives for exploitative attack, by penalizing aggression, and there by canceling out any anticipated gain. That can have knock-on effects by in turn reducing the need for preemptive strikes, let's do it to them before they do it to us, for deterrence, maintaining a 
belligerent stance to prove one's mettle, and of course, vengeance after the fact. Uh, in particular, by outsourcing our security and revenge to a disinterested third party, we can circumvent self-serving biases that social psychologists have shown that people are prone to. Everyone always thinks that the other guy's attacks are naked, unprovoked aggression out of the blue, whereas their own attacks are justified retaliation after the fact. When you have one side counting an uh, even number of attacks and believing that the scores have been settled, the other counting an odd number of attacks and believing that there's still justice to be done, you can have uh, endless cycles of revenge, vendetta, and blood feud, a spiral that can be nipped in the bud when it's some disinterested third party that is judging and meeting out justice. Some historical evidence for the effects of the Leviathan come from the pacifying and civilizing effects of states that I mentioned earlier in the talk, and the fact that we can watch this movie in reverse when government retreats, leaving behind zones of anarchy which are almost inevitably violent. The American Wild West, where you all remember the cliché of the cowboy movies, the nearest sheriff is 120 miles away, so you've got to defend yourself with your six-shooter, uh, failed states, collapsed empires, and mafias and street gangs who deal in contraband and therefore have to do business in a zone of anarchy. If you're a crack dealer and you think you've been cheated in a deal, it's not like you can press a lawsuit. Uh, if you feel threatened, you can't dial 911 because the activity you're engaged in is illegal in the first place. And this is why uh, contraband economies, which necessarily live in pockets of anarchy, uh, often breed high rates of violence. A second historical mechanism is the idea of gentle commerce, the idea that plunder is a zero-sum game, the, or negative sum, the gain to the victor is uh, cancelled out by the loss to the uh, victim, whereas trade is a positive-sum game, one in which everybody can win. And as improving technology allows the trade of goods and ideas over longer distances, among larger groups of people, and at lower cost, more and more of the rest of the world becomes more valuable alive than dead, and because it becomes, more, it becomes cheaper to buy stuff than to steal it. An obvious example is that despite all of the talk about the economic rivalry between the United States and China, it is extraordinarily unli unlikely that they will fight a war, uh, among other things, uh, they make all our stuff, and we owe them too much money. <laughs> Some historical evidence comes from uh, statistical studies showing that countries with open economies and a greater reliance on international trade are less likely to get embroiled in wars, are riven by fewer civil wars, and host fewer genocides. A third mechanism has been called the expanding circle. The term was originated by... Peter Singer, but the concept goes back to Charles Darwin, uh, that evolution gave us the capacity for empathy, but unfortunately, by default, we apply it only to a narrow circle of blood relatives, close allies, and cute little warm fuzzy animals. But over the course of history, one can see the circle of empathy expanding from the family to the village, the clan, the tribe, the nation, other races, both sexes, children, and perhaps eventually other species. Well, this just begs the question of what expanded the circle, and the technologies of cosmopolitanism that I alluded to earlier are a plausible candidate. The availability of history, literature, and uh, journalism. And a number of experiments have shown that if you get someone to uh, read or hear the words of another person, they will not only become more empathic toward that person, but to the entire category of people that that individual represents. Some historical evidence comes from the fact that humanitarian reforms are often preceded by new technologies for spreading ideas. In the 18th century, the humanitarian revolution was preceded by the Republic of Letters, the uh, massive expansion of literacy and printed discourse. The 20th century's long peace and rights revolution were preceded by the electronic global village. And in the 20th century, though it's uh, a bit too soon to tell, 
If the color revolutions in Arab Spring have happy endings, they will certainly be attributed to the rise of the internet and social media. Finally, there's the escalator of reason, the possibility that the expansion of literacy, education, and public discourse have encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. They rise above their parochial vantage point, which makes it harder to privilege their own interests over others. People step back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence and increasingly see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Some historical evidence comes from the fact that abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ tests, increased over the course of the 20th century, another strange but true secular trend. Uh, the so-called Flynn effect, by which IQ scores throughout the 20th century increased by about three IQ points per decade. Other studies have shown that people in societies with higher levels of education and measured intelligence commit fewer violent crimes, holding all else constant, cooperate more in experimental games, have more classically liberal attitudes, such as opposition to racism, homophobia, and xenophobia, and are more receptive to democracy in their countries 10 years down the line. The final question that I'll address is, if these four historical forces are all making us less violent, why do they all seem to be pushing in the same direction? I think it's because violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. It's always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but of course it is far more damaging to the victim. Since in the long run, victims can become uh, exploiters and vice versa, all parties would be better off if everyone could somehow agree to renounce violence. The dilemma is, how do you get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time as you do? Since if you beat your swords into plowshares, but the other guy keeps his as swords, uh, you could find yourself at the wrong end of, a, of an invading army. It's uh, not implausible to think that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually uh, worked away on this problem and chipped away at it, just like we've dealt with other scourges of the human condition, like pestilence and hunger. And the common denominator among the four historical forces that I mentioned is that all of them increase the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously. Regardless of what the best explanation of the decline of violence turns out to be, I think it has uh, implications that are profound. Among other things, it calls for a reorientation of our efforts towards violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. That is, instead of just lamenting why is there war, perhaps we should ask why is there peace? Not just what are we doing wrong, but what have we been doing right? because we have been doing something right, and it seems to me to be quite important to figure out what exactly it is. Also, the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity, of the centuries-long developments that have eroded the uh, influence of family, tribe, tradition, and religion, giving way to individualism, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. Now, everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us numerous gifts, longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, richer experiences, but there's always been a current of nostalgia and romanticism that has questioned the price. Is it worth it if we have to live in the shadow of terrorism, genocide, world wars, and nuclear weapons? But if, despite impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I believe that calls for a rehabilitation of the ideals of modernity and progress, and it's a cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is the paperback that there's lots of signed copies of. <laughs> <in> <laughs> Thank the, you for lobbying that. And um, so it's a year later, I guess. <laughs>
since it came out. What's been going on in the world in relation to this book since then? You've had reviews, pro and con probably. Um, there must have been some historians who said, what's a social psychi psychiatrist doing writing history? <laughs> yes. Uh, historians, are, uh, that is certainly true. And, and uh, uh, there are some historians for whom I, I am something of a carpetbagger mm -hmm. uh, coming into their, you know, invading their territory with all these numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, for me, a, a social scientist, this is just the kind of data that I always deal with, that multiple regressions and uh, statistical distributions and just the, for me, the obvious way to evaluate a hypothesis. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems to me that any time you use a word like increase or decrease or better or worse, you're making a quantitative claim. Mm -hmm. You're saying there are two points in time and there's a quantity and at one point it was higher than it is at a later point and, or vice versa. And so that whole class of historical hypotheses ought to be amenable to quantitative uh, examination. Now mm -hmm. granted, we don't have uh, ideal data stretching back 2,500 years. The farther back you go, the worse the data become. Right. But there are orders of magnitude and they themselves mm -hmm. tell a story. So, are, who are the historians who are slapping their forehead and saying, oh my God, he's right, and uh, we have to rethink what we do now? <laughs> well, I find that actually an awful lot of historians say their attitude is not so much he's wrong or, um, oh my goodness, look what he's shown. Uh, it's that, well, we kind of knew this, but it's kind of uncouth to say it or to mm -hmm. make much of a deal about it, partly mm -hmm. because it seemed, for various professional and moralistic reasons, well, mm -hmm. is it minimizing the tragedies of the 20th century? Uh, is it uh, saying that Western civilization has been doing something right? We can't admit that. Uh, so I find that it's actually, I haven't gotten a lot of, in fact, I don't think I've gotten any historians who've actually said, no, the trend's going in the opposite direction. The only exception has been uh, almost a philosophical argument that as long as we have the capacity to uh, kill more people more efficiently, namely nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. you can't say we're less violent if uh, we have the capability to do it. Well, that speaks to Paul Hawkins' question. He says, despite the decline in violence, has that had any impact upon the amount of fear that people experience yes. with respect to terrorism, potential violence, and so on? No, it's, it's a great question, and the answer is probably not. And in fact, I just saw the results of an opinion poll uh, that uh, shows that in the, in the 21st century, compared to the Cold War, people are more worried about death and destruction than they were when the US and Soviet Union were aiming ICBMs at each other. Mm. Uh, and this is, a, I think, a, a textbook case in the psychology of, of fear as opposed to the assessment of risk. That so what, as a social psychologist, what do you make of that? Is there this is something like one of those human nature things or is, you know, that there's a... Uh, there's got to always be so much fear and we'll use anything <laughs> to keep it going? Well, for or one what? thing, terrorism itself is, a, is itself a technology of fear. Uh, you can see that in the word. That's mm -hmm. what you know, the terror and terrorism means. It's how do you manufacture the greatest amount of fear per unit damage? Mm -hmm. And terrorism, actually, aside from the purely hypothetical possibility of nuclear terrorism, but actual terrorism kills uh, a very small number of people. Uh, even the worst terrorist event in history, 9-11, which mm. killed about 2,700 people. Mm. Uh, that's 2,700 tragedies and crimes. But uh, compared to the wars of years past, compared to homicides, uh, compared to tr you know, traffic accidents, mm -hmm. uh, it's really not a major risk factor to, for life and limb. And of course, combined with the, what the, the terrorist groups want to achieve, namely mm -hmm. manufacturing fear, there was the Bush administration that did its best to amplify the fear with mm -hmm. the, the duct tape and the, the, the orange you warnings. You think that was cynical or just panic? Uh, I think it was more panic mm -hmm. than, than cynicism. There may have been some cynicism too. Uh, Marshall Krauss says, what about the threats of mass destruction? You know, we hear about weapons of mass destruction over and over again. Yeah. Uh, atomic bomb, hydrogen bomb, uh, bioterror, and such. Well, let's see. The, um, 
certainly the risk of uh, a nuclear war is far smaller than it was during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. There has been, uh, I think it's not a coincidence that no nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki. Uh, they basically, other than deterring uh, existential threats, uh, they, they really have played very little role in war. Uh, that's why many countries without nuclear weapons have defied countries with them, knowing that the destruction of a nuclear weapon is so um, disproportionate to mm -hmm. any military achievement that, it, that they um, uh, are, are more of a bluff than an actual threat. Uh, Argentina invading the Falklands in uh, uh, 1981 is a perfect example. Britain had nukes, Argentina didn't, but Argentina and the generals knew that Britain wasn't going to leave Buenos Aires a radioactive crater, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, and there are many other examples. So given that the risk of interstate war is um, getting less and less, uh, given that even in the interstate wars that have occurred, not even a tactical battlefield nuclear weapon has been mm -hmm. used, um, I think it's safe to say that the risk is extremely low. Now for nuclear terrorism, the, uh, there probably was a window of vulnerability where uh, unguarded nukes from uh, you know, poorly guarded sites in the former Soviet Union were vulnerable. But even the, my understanding of the nuclear security uh, consensus is that that loophole, that window has been closed. There is still a non-zero risk of pilfering of nuclear material mm -hmm. that could result in the, the so-called you know, garage mm -hmm. nuke. Uh, even that, the people who actually try to estimate the probability, uh, I think, are in pretty close agreement that it's very small. Not that we should be complacent about it, not that there shouldn't be intelligence operations that uh, do their darndest, but uh, is it likely? I don't think it's likely. So I'm not, I think I'm going to pursue the idea of this sort of diet of fear uh, in the way that Hawken brought up, which is... It makes me wonder if people were fearful all the time back in the violent Middle Ages or uh, hunter-gatherer periods that you talked about. As you point out, we now like to, uh, we use violence as entertainment a lot. And Game of Thrones is doing very well. Uh, Taken 2 is in the theaters right now because it was so wonderfully violent. A uh, total revenge story, basically. Um, and then we, we have this kind of interesting displaced large-scale fear of it must be a very dangerous world because technology is moving so rapidly and therefore unpredictably and then uh, Bill Joy must be right that, that uh, the, the super-empowered individual uh, who's sufficiently crazy can do uh, enormous, possibly total harm. Um, are we doing fear instead of violence? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think we are doing a lot of fear. For one thing, not just fear, but also fear and concern. Uh, that is the impression that there's a lot of violence, which is stoked by the uh, availability of technology that can report violence more efficiently wherever it occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, anyone with a cell phone, and I don't know what the figures are for cell phone penetration globally, but they're Pretty Somebody high probably end. knows. How many cell phones out there percentage? What percentage of the world's population is cell phone enabled? More than 50 percent, right? Five billion cell phones. Five, five billion, billion out of seven phones. billion people, there are five billion cell phones. Every of one of which, two. or a large percentage of which, can beam color video footage uh, globally, instantly. And so the violence that does occur gets uh, reported. Uh, compare, say, World War I, where the British government censored all war photography until well mm. after the war was over. Those horrific battlefield scenes mm. strewn with corpses, effects of poison gas, were only released after the war. That is not possible today. And uh, the, the um, uh, benevolent result is that people are more horrified by violence, and I think that the availability of uh, media that report violence was one of the factors that drove it down. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it also leads to the misimpression mm -hmm. that the world is more violent than ever because of what cognitive psychologists have shown drives impressions of risk, namely memorable anecdotes. Uh, if you can imagine a gory plane crash, you think that plane travel is dangerous. Mm -hmm. The far more plentiful deaths in car accidents don't get reported on the evening news, and so you don't have any the same impression as, as to how common they are.
suppose all seven billion people read your book and um, you retired, but uh, <laughs> again, I'm working on this sort of budget of fear. Uh, if people had the confidence in your numbers and in the reality of the present, that violence, cruelty, and injustice actually is going down, it has further down to go, obviously, but we've got a record of a success that we can build on, what would a society be like that was less fearful? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I tend to think that, that uh, uh, contrary to the concern that mm -hmm. if you uh, publicize the progress that we've made, people will get complacent, uh, uh, it will desensitize people. Uh, I think it's the other way around, that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, there's a danger of compassion fatigue, of resignation, Human nature means we'll always be at each other's throats. Africa is a hellhole. What's the point of even trying to stop the violence? They'll always kill each other. Uh, if you, when you see the graphs and you see it going down, you realize, well, no, actually, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. we really, more and more of the world can be made more peaceful. Something, we're doing something right. I tend to think that it empowers people. It certainly changed my own attitude when going over these uh, more data. about that. What do you mean, from what to what? Well, I, uh, I think I was more likely to say there's just nothing, you know, nothing works. UN peacekeeping doesn't work. Um, democracy doesn't work. Uh, because you can think of failures. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it didn't stop, the United Nations didn't stop the genocide in uh, Rwanda or in Sarajevo. Um, we, we tried to make Iraq a democracy and look what happened there. Uh, and it is true that there, since all of these trends are statistical, there are counterexamples. The counterexamples are far more newsworthy than the success stories. You never see a guy in front of a camera with a microphone saying, here I am in Managua, and for 23, the 23rd year in a row there is no civil war. Uh, or I'm at, the, you know, I'm at the, the, the foot of the bed of, of, of uh, you know, Jaime Garfinkel, and he's dying of cancer in his 87th year. Mm -hmm. uh, boring. Whereas if the same guy got blown to bits, you can bet that it would lead the news. And so um, the, because all of these trends are statistical, they haven't brought violence down to zero, there are always enough examples to fill the news. Mm -hmm. Since our cognitive assessment of risk is driven by anecdotes and examples, we're going to be under the impression that nothing works even if the statistics massively show uh, an effect of some intervention. So you want statistical uh, literacy to absolutely. become the norm. Absolutely. And I'll give you one example, because this is one, uh, again, that people can't appreciate if they just think of, of the goriest incidents, and that is United Nations and other peacekeeping forces, the guys with the blue helmets who get themselves in between warring parties or that help pacify a uh, country after a ceasefire, prevent recidivism. Uh, do they work? The answer from the statistical studies is absolutely. They work massively. They, uh, it is, a country is much less likely to fall back in civil war if they've got armed peacekeepers. And the better financed and armed the peacekeeping force, the more effective they are. So this calls for boosting, and here again, the, the setting is appropriate. Boosting. 1945, right here, signed the UN Charter. Thank the, you, everybody. the United Nations uh, does a number of things badly, but mm -hmm. it does a number of things well, and one of them is uh, peacekeeping on average, not 100% of the time. The headlines would never tell you that, only a statistical study would. So you've been analyzing sort of human, mental, moral, ethical behavior change, and some of it you put in the individual, and some of it you put in this larger entity that I guess social psychologists look at that as something like society. How do those two relate? Yeah, we, I think this is one of the frontiers of social science. Mm -hmm. How does individual psychology, interconnected in social networks, mm -hmm. result in change in this strange entity we call uh -huh. culture so or internet, society? Is the internet now, you, one of your statements in there that I'll use in my summary is that new technologies of spreading ideas uh, spread peacefulness, basically. Well, so is that going to... Actually, my answer is more generic than that, because it's mm -hmm. not just the internet, it's not... I'm, uh, when I talk about social mm -hmm. networks, I don't mean Facebook. I mean I understand. everything going back literacy to... Literacy and... And even before literacy, language, face-to-face mm -hmm. uh, -face communication. I mean, the general... Uh, social scientists have mm -hmm. often talked about this thing called culture and society, but 
there isn't culture isn't this gas or miasma or, mm -hmm. or entity that actually exists separate from coordinated beliefs and negotiated agreements among large numbers of people. And the, the question of how changes in individual psychology propagate mm -hmm. across social networks, including face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. uh, in interaction, to change this thing called culture, I think is one of the great frontiers of research in social science. So how do norms, for example, propagate so quickly, mm -hmm. even when they are not um, enforced by the top, from the top down by a leviathan? So in, in our own lifetimes, for example, I, I, at a social gathering among educated people, no one would tell ethnic jokes. Uh, that wasn't true when I was a child, mm -hmm. for example. There's no, as far as I know, there's no law against it. You know, police mm -hmm. aren't going to come in and arrest you, but mm -hmm. it would just be horrifying now in a way that wasn't true in, uh, say, when, when, uh, when we were children. Or, uh, you know, there are ma many examples. Um, you know, letting your dog poop on the sidewalk it wasn't so long ago that, uh, that, that people did that. Uh, now it would be, um, you know, close to unthinkable. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Everybody's Changes thinking of exceptions, but it's the exceptions that, you know, it, yeah. that tells you there's a rule. And uh, liberal and, and conservative attitudes, which have been moving inexorably in the liberal direction, mm -hmm. with conservatives always you know, kicking and screaming in the rear guard. Mm -hmm. But um, debates that used to be held are no longer held. They're no longer within the realm of thinkable options. Racial segregation is one. Mm -hmm. uh, there used to be debates on it uh, with, you know, with two sides. Mm -hmm. uh, that was decided, it's a done deal. Um, equal employment opportunities for uh, women, uh, access to facilities by the handicapped, gays in the military, mm -hmm. uh, laws against criminalized homosexuality. Once they're done, you know, they're done. And uh, how that, uh, so there are certain reforms that are done with the stroke mm -hmm. of a pen, but there are other things that just become, uh, you know, un unthinkable. You just don't, you don't go there anymore. Okay, I'd well, love to know how that happens. You're telling me it hasn't gone away. There's two questions on it. Janet Thompson asks, how do you see the role of religion in either the increase or decrease of violence? Richard Lee asks, what effects has the rise of secularism and religious fundamentalism had on trends in violence? Yeah. Well, the thing about religion is that it itself is both effect and cause of a lot of these developments. So there's no easy answer to whether religions make things more or less peaceful because the very forces that I think that have changed attitudes and practices have changed religions. So we don't, uh, religion isn't what it used to be. The, the major... You're thinking of Christianity, I can just tell. Uh, particularly probably Judaism too now that Well, I if you first compare, say, Judaism to the version of the, the Hebrew Bible. Is very yes. tough. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we think it's such a great idea to massacre every last Midianite. Uh, every man, woman, and child, uh, or, or Moabite, or Jebusite, or you know, Hizite, and so on. Um, no Christian sect today would advocate burning heretics at the stake. So the religions themselves have done a lot of damage. <laughs> just checking. You know. yeah, just checking. Uh, and um, so even though certain, at certain times in history, militant religions have... Uh, like later ideologies, mm -hmm. resulted in, in huge numbers of deaths. The, the European wars of religion, the Crusades uh, are examples. Uh, and there is, I think, still a, a, a danger from the militant versions of uh, Islam, as we see it in the papers. Is that likely to change over time? Is Islam going through something now? Maybe the Christianity went through 300 years ago with religious wars. Uh, I think it's not implausible. I wouldn't mm -hmm. predict it with, mm -hmm. you know, with, with high, high confidence, but mm -hmm. I think it's certainly a, uh, a, a plausible scenario. How do religions and ideology intersect, if at all? Because one, one of the strong arguments in your book is that ideologies are lethal, and you make the point that ideologies that have a utopian vision of where we can get to and the infinite value of that then uh, makes plausible causing, uh, doing very evil things in the near term because it'll pay off in the future. Um, ideologies relate to religions at all? Yes, well, I think religions are, are based on, on uh, ideologies. And I think what we we're seeing is a new uh, ideology, if you want to call it that. I think psychologically it functions like an ideology, but the difference being that it can actually be rationally justified. And that is the doctrine of... Uh, humanism or human rights. Mm 
uh, the idea that all moral, legal, and political systems ought to maximize the flourishing and minimizing the suffering of sentient beings. Now, that sounds almost like, you know, to us, like pabulum, like, well, Sentient yeah, of course. beings are numberless. I vow to save but, them. That's in a religion. But what? Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them is a religious saying from Buddhism. Oh, okay. So. Well, they're ahead of its time then. Uh, but it's, it's actually surprising how uh, radical and new this idea is. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is only uh, passed in 1948, and the, the advocates of it had to pull teeth and, and, and twist arms to get countries to sign it. The idea that uh, everyone, every individual human has a right to life and lib liberty and flourishing because the easier idea is, is the, the one that comes naturally to us mm -hmm. in, uh, includes intuitions like tribalism, mm -hmm. the glory of the ethnic group, the tribe, the clan, the nation, the religion mm -hmm. is has primacy, and individual people are just like cells in a body, like, mm -hmm. like ants in a, in a colony or bees in a hive and are expendable. It's the, the hive itself that's valuable. The idea that purity, sanctity are bigger than any one of us and that it's mm -hmm. permissible to uh, kill in order to preserve the purity or sanctity of the group. Mm -hmm. All of these intuitions which Jonathan Haidt has uh, identified um, I think uh, Haidt is right that they do tend to define our moral intuitions. And here's where I disagree with Haidt. I think it's a purging of a lot of these probably biological sources of moral intuitions down to the austere, narrow doctrine of human rights as our acceptable moral ideology that is the cause of the decline of violence in the realm of ideas. Mm -hmm. And the great ideological change is that the doctrine of human rights, as opposed to communism and nationalism and mm -hmm. fascism and Nazism and militant religions, uh, does lead to more humane practices. So I've been bugging you to do a book on the history of ideology. Do you, do you think there's a, an interesting history to be told there, if not by you, by somebody? I think there is an interesting history, and I think there's an interesting, I don't know if you want to call it... Uh, connection science or, or uh, social network science, the kind of thing that, uh, among hmm. others, uh, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler and Duncan Watts and, uh, and uh, Michael Macy do. That is, how do norms um, uh, proliferate and uh, consolidate themselves in a society, given that the society is uh, you know, in one way of looking at it, it's the sum of the individual human minds that make it up. Mm -hmm. In another way of looking at it, there are norms that seem to have a life of their own by virtue of being coordinated in many, many minds simultaneously, sometimes for good, sometimes for, uh, for ill, including toxic beliefs and ideologies that we know from history can spread, the mm -hmm. extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds, witch mm -hmm. hunts, for example. Uh, people were convinced, or at least said they were convinced, that, uh, that witches could turn men into dogs and uh, cause ships to sink and crop mm -hmm. failures, things that your own eyes tell you can't be true, but that society-wide uh, that belief can become entrenched. I think it's a very uh, exciting and important topic how uh, these... Uh, society-wide effects mm -hmm. can grow out of the transfer of beliefs uh, among individuals. Now, one of the things you refer to is cosmopolitanism, and there's a, a book by that name by Kwame Appiah, the ethical philosopher. And uh, urbanization is one of the things that is um, basically, you know, skyrocketing right now. Will probably level off the word 80 percent urban. Uh, does cosmopolitan suggest that when we're 80% urban, we'll be uh, you know, seriously that kind of less violent and, uh, and less hurtful and less unjust because we... Well, ex explain how yeah. the... What is cosmopolitan ethics? Yeah. Well, it's the... Um, in um, Appiah's conception, it's partly the, the fact that individuals can have multiple identities, so uh, the ah, intersecting identities. banker by day, leather by night. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> For example, mm -hmm. or the, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Or the question that was pretty common a hundred years ago. Guys in uh, suits who go around in cowboy boots or something going on. <laughs> There's an ex another example, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, that great progressive president, Woodrow Wilson, said that any, referring to, you know, Italian Americans and Polish Americans, said that any person with a hyphen in his identity is like a, uh, the hyphen is like a dagger aimed at the heart of the republic. Spanish yeah. American. Oh. <laughs> now, that is... Uh, it's, you don't know whether it's revolting or quaint or puzzling, mm -hmm. but we can't have that belief anymore. Uh, it just seems like, what do you mean you can't have an Italian-American? I mean, then you have to choose. Either you're Italian or American. You can't be both. Again, a word that might seem to be uh, kind of saccharine, diversity, mm -hmm. uh, is really, a, by historical standards, a major advance. The fact that you don't have to have um, uh, unanimity, complete conformity within mm -hmm. a, a culture, but there can be uh, the diversity. Cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism also involves just rubbing shoulders with people unlike you, which makes it a little bit hard to think that they, harder to think they are animalistic, brutish, mm -hmm. uh, uh, non-sentient, uh, mm -hmm. and so on, beliefs that are articulated in many racist ideologies. Now, they, it's not a guarantee that if you throw people together in, in cities that they won't develop these toxic beliefs, but I think it does reduce the probability. And I think it's also significant, and this is a curious feature of, idea, of, of dangerous utopian ideologies that a mm -hmm. number of historians of genocide have pointed out, which is that many of the genocidal ideologies of the 20th century have been staunchly anti-urban. They have, been, ah. they have envisioned a golden age that, uh, involving a return to the country, uh, living in harmony with the land. Mm -hmm. This was true of Nazism, mm -hmm. which demonized the cities, and the Jews, of course, were, were, were uh, uh, residents of cities, mm -hmm. that sought to empty German cities and return the Volk to the, to the land. That's why Hitler invaded Poland, is to... to get Lebensraum, room for Germans to return to the land as, as uh, farmers. This was true of Mao's insane uh, collectivization scheme of Pol Pot, emptying uh, the cities and forcing people into the countryside. There's something about the vision of people living in harmony with nature and not being uh, corrupted by the unruly chaos and mixing of the city that appeals to the totalitarian, indeed genocidal mindset. So uh, cities, cities are definitely a liberalizing force. Yeah, well, as a survivor of the 60s and 70s, uh, when you know, Wendell Berry would basically evoke Thomas Jefferson, uh, who wanted the gentleman, the yeoman farmer, <laughs> the yeoman farmer and hated yes. cities and... There's been a lot of city hating in, in various romantic uh, thinking from Rousseau on. Yeah. Right through the, you know, the early hippies all went to the countryside and got bored and came back. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a real dedication that, you know, and we admired Mao's communes, for Pete's sake, and backyard steel mills and barefoot doctors. And, you know, I don't let my contemporaries forget how wrong we were <laughs> on some of these subjects. Well, the other, and the other dimension, historical dimension to that is that many of the great uh, ideas of the Enlightenment mm -hmm. sprang from the salons and coffee houses in cities, especially uh, free ports, Amsterdam, mm -hmm. uh, London, Boston. Um, Paris wasn't a, a major mm -hmm. ocean port, but it still had a uh, lively intellectual discourse. But democracy and um, cosmopolitan ideals, not coincidentally, come from the what it, cosmopolis, the, uh, the polis. And oddly enough, here we are in a city having a San Francisco, discussion. yeah. Um, with the president of the nation just down the street. That's interesting. <laughs> so, okay, uh, it's a year later. Uh, you're not doing uh, volume two of this book, I'm sure. What are you working on now? What question <laughs> are you asking yourself? Uh, you know, if anything, the pressure is deep been, and real. And then John people Brockman people ask me, can you write a shorter version of it? Can you, can you condense it? No, not add a, uh, listen, this yeah. long version, I will make the argument that he will not make is one is this is so unwelcome uh, an argument for a lot of people that he needed to have all of the, you saw just a glimpse of the 
the, the stories and the data and the graphs and all that stuff, but also just the analysis, line by line, page by page, chapter by chapter, is so good that it is a complete argument. And it, I think it takes a big book to make an argument this profound, this mind-changing, uh, complete, humble opinion. Oh, thank you. What are you yeah. working on now? Uh, something completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, a, uh, my next book project will be a style manual uh, based on <laughs> <laughs> based on uh, modern linguistics and cognitive science. Now that we know more than we used to about the workings of language, the workings of the human mind as it uh, processes language, mm -hmm. can we turn that knowledge into advice on how to write more clearly and stylishly? So what's the news here? You did the language instinct quite a while ago. Yeah, 94. And you focused on language in a number of your books. So what's different? What, what's the news that you've got that we all need to hear? Uh, you mean what will go into this new book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, uh, three, uh, three main sets of ideas. Mm -hmm. One of them is the, um, just the mechanics of human memory and attention as we work our way through a sentence. What, sen what sentence hmm. structures ease the listener, give a, I mean the reader, uh, give the reader a sense of a elegant, flowing, mm -hmm. uh, easy to understand sentence. Mm -hmm. And that involves things like the waxing and waning of memory load, mm -hmm. the choice of word and construction depending on the point you are in a story, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and other details of, of co cognitive processes. A second is... It must what be is a multi-level process the mind is doing when it's doing all that stuff. Yes, absolutely, that's right. Every, there, there's parallel computation mm -hmm. at the level of sound, of course. Mm -hmm. Even when you read, we all sound out words, even skilled readers. Uh, hmm. Syntax, um, semantics, the meaning of a sentence, and discourse, the flow of an argument or story. Mm -hmm. and, and those are all working in parallel and exchanging information back and forth. A second is, uh, what is your conception of what you're doing when you're writing and anticipating that someone is going to read what you're writing? Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's an artificial situation. Here I am you know, in my study going tappity tappity tap, and then years later, someone who I've never met is going to be picking that up, and I have this vain hope of exchanging ideas with that person. So uh, how do I, since that is impossible, uh, what is the model that I should have in mind uh, of my uh, reader and of the process of communication? John Steinbeck wrote all of his novels to his father and just took the dear dad off the beginning. Interesting. And, um, he had a very specific audience in mind, and other writers I know often do that, that they have the sort of ideal reader that they want to tickle their fancy and persuade them and make them laugh or whatever it is. I think that's, that, that is a uh, profound uh, part of the writing process. But, mm -hmm. And moreover, I mean, this is an idea that I'm going to uh, um, adapt from Mark Turner and um, uh, Francine Noel, mm -hmm. is that the, the mental model that you should have of your father or of your friend mm -hmm. is that you are uh, calling their attention to something in the world that they can see with their own eyes if their attention is, were only properly directed to it. Hmm. That is the overarching conception of what one, one ought to do when writing good prose, they argue. And I think there's a lot of, that has many implications and uh, that's an idea of theirs that I'm going to run with. And then the third is, how do you make sense of uh, questions of usage and style? If someone says, uh, if I say, oh, that roller coaster really made me nauseous, and someone said, no, 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 you've made a gr an error. Uh, it, ha it has to be nauseated, because nauseous means causing nausea, not experiencing <laughs> nausea. You say, what the hell are you talking about? I've right. never heard anyone use it. And they say, no, 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 that's what's correct. You've just made an error. And I say, well, if I'm making an error, then 99% of the people under the age of 75 are making the same error, so how can it be an error? They said, no, 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 trust me, it really is an error. How do you make sense of that kind of debate, which the various uh, language mavens and nitpickers and um, smarty pants will always make, but at the same time recognizing that there is a point to correct mm -hmm. usage. I mean, when, when uh, George W. Bush used the word misunderestimated, <laughs> There is a sense and we all thought was, all stupid, and then we all thought that's a pretty interesting word. 
Well, <laughs> there's a sense in which, you know, you, there is a sense in which you can really say that that's an error, or that, uh, say, divisive po policies vulcanize our society. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that really is wrong. Now, mm -hmm. granted, it could catch on, maybe in 100 years it could be right, but now we can say that it's wrong. So how do we make sense of this very strange entity called grammatical correctness that no one legislates, mm -hmm. that can change over time, mm -hmm. but that any given slice in time has some norms that, uh, that a careful writer ought to respect? So the third part of the book is, how, how should a careful writer make sense of this strange phenomenon of uh, correct usage? You have to read a lot of contemporary stuff for a start. Yeah. yeah. So let's leave the audience with something that you've probably experienced, um, which is many of them will go to wherever they go. And, and uh, so how was Pinker's talk? Well, he says that violence, cruelty, and injustice is going down. And uh, whoever they talk to will say, that can't, can't possibly be. And so there's a resistance to this yeah. news. And I don't know if it's resistance to good news, we're weird about that, uh, or that we've made such an investment in the fear and the, you know, these are the worst of times, the most violent century, all this kind of stuff, or what it is. What do you think is the structure of the opposition to your thesis? Uh, the opposition would be, um, well, one, one line of opposition would be the capacity, uh, that is, as long as nukes exist, um, we can't be called a nonviolent society. Robert J. Lifton, for example, mm -hmm. made that argument. Uh, a second is, just you wait. Um, just you wait. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, either... How long should... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, that's a legitimate majority. Yeah. So, and the, the just you wait objection takes two forms. One of them is the kooks with nukes. Mm. It's kooks only a matter of time mm -hmm. before you know, a terrorist cell will, will uh, invent a nuclear bomb in their garage. Um, the other version is... Um, Remember, 100% of men have thought about killing somebody. <laughs> yes. But very, very few of us have actually done it, which shows the essential role of self-control and inhibition in uh, the conduct of every, everyday life. Freud was right about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ego and the, and the superego really don't, don't leave home without it. Without okay. Them. Uh, but the other, the other version of that objection is the um, climate change, global warming, resource wars of the future. Mm. Uh, we're going to run out of water, we're going to run out of oil, um, uh, ocean levels will rise inevitably, uh, people will kill each other. And people have been wrong. Uh, the calamity callers have been wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and keep on calling calamity. So what are we dealing with here? Well, there are two dimensions. One of them is, um, you know, will there be these shortages? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, so, and, and you're right that all of the predictions of resource sh mm -hmm. shortages have all been shown to be wrong and mm -hmm. probably will. There, there is climate change and I, I suspect that, that uh, man-made climate change will cause a lot of misery and waste. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, don't, don't think there's, I'm not, certainly not skeptical about climate change, but what I am skeptical of is that climate change will lead to an increase in wars. I mean, it can lead to plenty of Thank misery. You. Yeah, I was, I was wrong. The opening chapter to my book, Whole Earth Discipline, I said climate change is going to lead to a lot of war. Data is in. I was wrong. Uh, climate change yeah. is not leading to a lot of war. No. I mean, it could lead to, it could be, lead to a lot of bad things, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily include war because... Um, is another thing you don't appreciate until you look at the, the um, historical record and the, and the statistics, but um, uh, not only the complicated statistical studies that try to correlate climate stress at time one, like droughts in Africa, with mm -hmm. civil war at time two, most of the studies find little to no correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is not to say that you know, the droughts and, and, and famines uh, shouldn't be a high area of concern. They, they obviously are. People die. They shouldn't die. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't it isn't, though, that the problem is that wars are fought over them. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you think about it, there, uh, unless you have the... There is a paranoid view that all wars are fought over resources. They're just very... They're hidden by the great conspiracy. Vietnam right. was really about tungsten and, uh, you know, that line of thinking. Tungsten? If you put a, put a, tungsten? Tungsten, yeah. Okay. I had a professor in, when I was in college who insisted that it was really all about tungsten. <laughs> There's a lot of tungsten in the South China Sea. 
Uh, and that's what they're, forget ideology, it's not you know, communism, it's not democracy, it's not containment, it's all tungsten, I'm telling you, it's tungsten. So, and there are people who believe that every war is over oil or tungsten and so on, but if you look at what historians say, mm -hmm. it's actually not that easy to find wars that are fought over resources. Ah. Resor wars are fought over cosmic justice, over fear, over revenge, over ideology. But uh, there aren't a whole lot of wars where there was some finite resource essential to two societies and they, they, they uh, amassed their armies to hmm. see who controlled it. I mean, to kind of, you know, th you know th think about it. Vietnam, not, obvi not obviously about that. Mm. Uh, you know, World War II, World War I. Uh, anyway, so um, it's uh, both individual salient cases and the statistical studies show there's a, a loose, at least in the past, a loose correlation, in the recent past, a loose correlation between resource stress and armed, organized armed conflict. There could be local skirmishes, there could be uh, neighboring populations that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that pick at each other, mm -hmm. but in terms of getting an army out, uh, that tends not to be what wars are fought over. Now, of course, that could change, but so far, that's, that's what not, wars aren't fought over. The other, that, okay. Mm, go ahead. Yeah. That, that's one prediction to keep an eye on. What yeah. else? Um, then there's, uh, there, there are various ways of, um, there, there have been objections that uh, uh, a number of my statistics have been on a per capita basis. Mm. Uh, that maybe if you looked at absolute numbers, uh, that should be the, uh, appropriate target of our moral concern. Mm -hmm. The answer to which is, first of all, the numbers have gone down in absolute terms as well as in per, ca uh, per capita basis, at least, uh, say, since 1946. Mm -hmm. The sheer number of people killed in wars has gone way down, even mm -hmm. as the world's population has, uh, has, has more than doubled. Uh, but also, it really is per capita basis that is the intelligent way to assess likelihood of, of mm -hmm. uh, violence in different eras. We're getting a lot more capitas. There's seven billion going on to nine billion and then probably level off. Yeah, and, there, it, and the, the intuition is, well, uh, would it be right to say that we're living in more peaceful times if the number of acts of aggression stayed constant but there were just more and more people? That seems like cheating. The answer is no, it's not cheating because mm. if there are more people, there are, every person born means another person who has the potential to be a genocidal maniac, a hot-headed uh, teenager, mm -hmm. a uh, rabble-rouser, uh, an old lady who puts arsenic in her husband's tea. Uh, the number of perpetrators has to grow every time a person comes into existence. If, as more and more people populate the earth, the, somehow the number of acts of, of violence remain constant. Something very significant has been going on that prevents all those extra people from doing what their ancestors did mm -hmm. and turning with a certain probability into uh, killers and rapists and, and so on. Uh, but again, that having been said, all those statistics that consisted of zeros mean that even if you look at the absolute number of people, uh, it's been going down. I get a sense that there's work to do uh, but what I love about your book is it shows how the work can keep going forward. Thank you for it. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.